Betroffenen von anderen Menschen schon besucht worden sind und dabei kommen natürlich äh, Situationen zustande, die einmalig sind und die auf jeden Fall erzählenswert sind und ganz besonders auch zu zeigen sind. Tui hat ihr ganzes Leben lang eigentlich äh, in Regionen gelebt, die einzigartig waren. Wir werden da jetzt gleich in dem Vortrag noch einiges mitbekommen. Mich persönlich freut es ganz arg, hier auch nochmal bei diesem äh, schönen Event so viele Besucher hier begrüßen zu dürfen. Und äh, ich möchte Ihnen jetzt die nächsten 45 Minuten ähm, alles Gute wünschen. Tui, deswegen habe ich jetzt auch Deutsch gesprochen, Tui spricht sehr gut Deutsch, aber sie wird nachher den Vortrag auf, auf Englisch halten. Es gibt noch die Möglichkeit, ähm, ich glaube, simultan Übersetzungsheadsets äh, zu bekommen. Und danach, und das ist auch eine einmalige Gelegenheit, weil Tui kommt aus oder wohnt gerade in Neuseeland, ähm, die einmalige Gelegenheit noch sich ein Buch zu signieren lassen. Sie hat eine ganze Reihe Bücher gemacht, die gibt es dann vorne im Ausgang zu kaufen. Ich kann es nur empfehlen, einige absolute Klassiker do dabei. Ähm, jetzt möchte ich auch gar nicht mehr weitere Worte verlieren. Ich freue mich ganz arg auf deinen Vortrag und wünsche Ihnen ganz arg viel Spaß dabei. Danke, Emanuel. Es ist auch für mich ein sehr großes Vergnügen, hier zu sein. Trotzdem, dass ich als Kind Deutsch gelernt habe, ich glaube, heute werde ich ähm, genießen über die äh, Besetzung, Übersetzung, dass Sie brauchen können und lieber doch in Englisch sprechen. So, I will switch to English because it is more my normal language, although I was raised in French and then English. And I remember some German from my childhood. So well, it's a real pleasure to be here. And it's quite unusual for me actually to talk about myself. I usually talk about my work, but not usually about actually my own story. So this is an exciting moment for me to tell you a little bit about what it is that drives my work and why wildness is what I seek to illustrate in my books, both in the writing and in the photograph, in the photography. I grew up as a, something of a wild child back in the Galapagos Islands, and I will tell you a little bit more about that life as I go further along. But it certainly never, I never imagined that someday I would be standing here speaking with so many enthusiastic people about my life in those very distant islands. That was a very sort of uh, pioneering lifestyle where I lived uh, somewhat like a, a marine predator in my childhood. And then as I grew older, I became quite a fanatic conservationist and of course a photographer. And to express my passion for nature, for wildness, and for wild places, I decided quite early on that really my best medium was not just writing, but actually illustrating my passion with photography, nature photography and wildlife photography. Needless to say, photography of wild animals is specifically about seeing. And seeing is indeed very much in the eye of the beholder. It's, there is not one way of seeing, there is not 10 ways of seeing. There are as many ways of seeing as there are eyes on this earth. Not just our eyes. Yeah. Is it possible to dim the lights a little bit more? Um, just for the reflection on the screen? Thank you. There are so many different ways of looking at the world. And what I like to try and do is to look at it and to try to understand a little bit beyond what I see. And I think that photography has taught me something very special, and that is to look at the subtleties that I would otherwise never notice, that I would never see, to look at the light to look at the ephemeral aspects of what we see around us every day. It's not just to see, but it's actually how to see, what to see, and how to interpret. And that has been the guiding light in my work. That is also the guiding light in how I write. And I write very much together with how I photograph. So it's become a, a complete package, if you like that I have uh, tried to convey in all of my books. 
not only how to see, but where to look. And indeed, for a wildlife photographer, eye contact is really what it is all about, what the whole story is represented by that contact between what we see and what the wild animals see. And eye contact really is the holy grail of wildlife photography. And there are, again, many different ways of representing that. But eye contact can really tell, I think, an entire story sometimes in very few images. For example, the tragedy of the elephants in Africa and the way that they are being exterminated and poached at a very accelerating rate nowadays. So I do use my my profession to try to convey what I think are important messages about what's going on in the natural world, about the need for us to look after things and uh, wildlife and wild places. But I also very much try to convey what I am hoping to understand to people perhaps who spend less time. But it's not so much what I'm trying to understand but, and also what I'm trying to see in the animal's eyes but also, more than anything, what they see in each other. What I try to do as much as possible is to try to look at the world the way perhaps they look at the world and how they choose perhaps sometimes not to see each other, just like we sometimes choose not to see. And so it is that I'd like to try and sort of be part of the herd, be part of the scene and bring that home in my books and in my lectures is that feeling of the true wildness, which is where I really feel most at home, and how I try to understand it. I'm not saying that I understand everything, but I try to understand as much as I can. And therefore, I have a, what I would call a very deep trust in wild animals. I think they are more, sometimes more honest than people, and I've never had any problems with wild animals because of that trust, I think. And it's the intimacy that I sense between them and towards me sometimes that has been the strength and the, the foundation of my work, of what I write about. And very luckily for me, it, this has led to a lot of uh, very interesting projects, some very nice uh, projects about animals and places that are really quite a long way away from the mainstream, uh, quite a, a variety of topics, many different books. I've published uh, six different books with a small publisher in New Zealand, Bateman, David Bateman Publishing, and we have a, a very rewarding relationship producing these books. Again, it's a case of looking for the that contact with the wild animals and to try to illustrate that contact and to try to bring significance. It doesn't really matter what the animals are, it's that personal contact that is difficult to achieve but always extremely rewarding and exciting which I find um, is really, those are the gems in my career, is to make these meetings with different animals, whether the first one was a Galapagos marine iguana, a Komodo dragon, or in this case, a hyena in the African savanna at night. I was just using a torchlight to take the picture, no flash, laying in the grass, and we're sharing our mutual curiosity. Curiosity is something that we feel very strongly as humans, but many animals feel that curiosity as well. And getting down on their level, being part of their world, trying to show that you're interested in them, but you're not actually trying to dominate them because you get down low, you're showing your submission, elicits that curiosity. And at the end of the day, it also produces some very exciting photographs. So here's just a few examples of different situations. Not always graceful, not always easy, but um, they do bring the animals into their, their personality, their, their, their ego almost can be expressed so much better when you get on their level. It doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter with what animal, as long as they are trusting enough to trust me up close, you get that feeling. Some situations are a little bit exciting and uh, the results nonetheless can be quite lovely. A few are even more exciting such as uh, trying to do this with elephants. I can assure you that when you get up close, down low, groveling in the grass, an elephant looks 
awfully big. So ultimately, my, my deepest desire is to share the world of these animals and to share it with them, have them share their, their world as much as possible with me, and then for me to share it with my audience, with my readers. And uh, metaphorically, I would like to fly with the birds, swim with the fish, and tell their stories, tell their plight, tell their problems, such as global warming affecting so many animals at the far ends of the planet in places where we don't even think anything is happening and indeed uh, very deep changes are happening at the extremities of the planet and that's what I want to try and bring home and share. So a little bit more about my real, my background. This is probably my earliest memory when I was two years old. Um, my family started a pioneering life in the Galapagos Islands, which are about a thousand kilometers from the coast of South America in the Pacific. Uh, it was uh, back in 1955. My parents had grown up during the war in Belgium. They, wanted, they had a dream. They wanted to raise their children in the tropics in a self-sufficient kind of lifestyle. And that was the dream that pushed them to leave Belgium when I was two years, before I was two years old, and to move to the Galapagos Islands. This was my first home. And indeed, um, I arrived on, the, on these islands when I was two years, on the day of my second birthday. My second home was a little bit more permanent, but it was still fairly basic. Life was a, truly a pioneering lifestyle. My brother, as they had planned, was born uh, three days after we actually moved into the permanent house. We lived pretty much off the land. There was no jobs, no very little cash economy, um, no electricity. We had to fish and hunt and use the sea for our, our bathing. There was a limited amount of fresh water, enough to drink, and uh, but a lot of the non-essential use of water was in the sea. This was my schoolroom, the old packing crate that came from Belgium. And uh, here my parents taught myself and my brother the tools of learning, not necessarily the contents. They felt it was more important that we learn how to learn, how to look, how to read, how to write, not what to look at, not what to read and write. And indeed, nature was mostly my classroom, asking questions, wondering why things are the way they are. And that is really what I have done my entire life and still do. All of my friends as, small, as a small child were essentially wild animals, big and small, strange and beautiful and ugly and whatever. But this was not to eat. This was just to play. Um, anything was a source of curiosity for me. And indeed, some of those friendships lasted a long time. This little heron that I tamed when it was quite young was my friend for many years. And even later, when I started to use my camera, I used this friendship to because we had a total trust to photograph this little bird when it was living out in the wilds. Here's with my brother looking at a nice spider. My father was a, a special man. He had... A, considerable independent spirit, as you might imagine, to, to go and live in such a, a distant place. And he was a naturalist at heart, had a very inquisitive spirit, and indeed ended up helping to make many discoveries of uh, new species. And some of these species, you might recognize the names. My brother's name is Jill, and um, the family has a few names now that will remain after we are gone on some of these species that my family helped to discover and bring to the world. My father also designed and built a 10 meter sailboat. We all helped, of course, but he made the plans and designed it. And this was completely without power tools, without electricity, 
all by hand. And with this boat, we were able to explore the different islands in the Galapagos much better because otherwise, for many years, we were just we only knew the one island in the center of the of the archipelago where we lived, Santa Cruz Island. He was also very keen on photography. He brought a lot of film and chemicals to do his own enlarging when he came to Galapagos, and I borrowed his camera, but then I actually started to sell some dried goat skins to the very few tourists that came so that I could buy my own camera. And in 1969, this was the shot that I took on my very first roll of color film, and I still cherish that picture in the old days of Kodachrome. I had a desire, I was fascinated by the scientists who came to the islands and my desire was to actually create a complete collection of all the different activities of the bird life um, in the Galapagos, of all the aspects of their life cycle, their courtship, their nesting, their breeding. And I thought this would be a very simple, honest, straightforward project. I must admit that 40 years later, I am still continuing to add photos to that particular project. So gradually my photography in the Galapagos evolved and expanded and I tried different techniques and I had different opportunities. The islands may seem like uh, a fairly, uh, it's a natural place to photograph but even so there are moments where you see something that you will never see again. For example this shot, I only once in my life did I see sea lions playing with flamingos in the same pool. Most of the animals in the Galapagos are unique and so they are found nowhere else in the world and that again gives you many chances to take photos that uh, are indeed unrepeatable anywhere else. I also, as a child, I tamed some of the famous Darwin's finches that were the source of the theory of evolution by Charles Darwin. And 50 years later, my mother still lives in the Galapagos. I have been living in New Zealand now for 20 years, but my mother still lives there. I visit her every year and we still feed the flock of finches that continue to come, have been coming for 50 years without interruption to our little handouts. And to our great surprise, or rather her great surprise, um, a couple of years ago, the president of Ecuador knocked on the door and said, can I see your finches? And so there he was, smiling, getting away from politics for a, few, a, few, a couple of hours, feeding her tame finches. She was a very beautiful lady and, in fact, I think still is. So that is, in a very short form, the story of my life in the Galapagos Islands and uh, the story of how I became a photographer. The islands very much impressed me right from the start, as you might guess, and they really formed my view of the world and they also formed the basis of all of my work everywhere else. I was able to produce my classic book, which has been in print now for 15 years and is still a very popular book about the islands, about my experiences growing up there and uh, explaining what I saw and what I experienced. And indeed, many other books arose from that original um, fire. And then uh, I continue to build up the collection year after year when something very special happens, like a volcanic eruption, and go back to the places that I know best again and again. And I think I will, in a year or two, I will produce yet another book, which will be the more the wide views of the Galapagos, the big landscapes with the wildlife, not just the portraits of the wildlife, but the, the broader views, the, the, the deeper feelings that the islands uh, produce to, to the visitor, to the person who sees it, and indeed that's really where my spirit feels most at home amongst these animals that are so trusting and so beautiful and so varied. Many, as I said, are totally unique. For example, this is a, a seagull, the only seagull in the world that um, feeds at night and flies away from the, the islands during the evening with these huge eyes to catch fish and squid in the open ocean at night. Nowhere else in the world do you have anything like that. Other birds are fascinating to photograph, the, the brown pelican, for example. And I go back again and again. This is a photo I took just on my last visit there a few months ago, trying to get the perfect shot 
of a pelican diving and then the underwater view of that activity. Um, I tried different techniques to show the activity, the action, and so on and on. I continue, I will never be finished photographing the Galapagos Islands, I believe. In um, 2009 was quite a famous event because that was the anniversary of 50 years since the Galapagos became a national park, the first national park in South America. So for that occasion, I produced a very different kind of book to celebrate this event, including the, the 200th anniversary of Charles Darwin and so on, and the, the Darwin Foundation, which was uh, set up also 50 years ago to study the islands. And in this book, instead of writing the book myself, I decided to invite many of the scientists who have been working there for many years to write their story in a popular manner. And it was really a very exciting and very new project for me. I started with inviting um, Charles Darwin's great-great-granddaughter, who was at the time doing her PhD study on the endemic tomato plants of the Galapagos, uh, including comparing the specimens that her ancestor had collected, how they compare with today's plants, because there are some problems with cross-pollinization with cultivated types. So it's, uh, it was a very exciting project to have all these uh, famous scientists come together and write short chapters about the most exciting parts of their work. Um, this is a couple who have been studying the Darwin's finches for many years and have actually been able to show the process of evolution in action over a period of these years. Another species was the discovery of a totally new species of a large meter-long iguana that nobody knew existed on top of the very highest volcano of Galapagos, about 15 100 meters, 1,500 meters above sea level, the pink iguana, strange looking animal. Some of the animals that are quite in danger because of climate change, the Galapagos penguin is one of the rarest penguins in the world, the only one found on the equator and uh, suffering from some of the effects of El Nino. Other conservation stories are very exciting. For example, the breeding of these little tortoises into big tortoises. Um, this particular species was down to just 15 individuals on one island because of the, the fishermen in the past and the whalers in the past taking the animals, the tortoises, from the island. Just 15 were left. And because of the conservation work and the breeding of these tortoises, now there are several thousand again living on this island. So that was a very different experience for me and indeed it led to some very exciting moments where the Galapagos National Park decided to publish this book in Spanish and produced a, um, a thousand copies to give to the island population to teach them what is so special about the islands they live in. And for that I actually received a medal as a honorary park warden of the Galapagos National Park. So it was a rather exciting moment. So all this to say that really the Galapagos Islands got their name from the giant tortoise, but I feel that for me personally they also gave me my identity and my, uh, my reason for exploring further, for going into the world as my little business name is the roving tortoise the tortoise that wanders around the world to go look for other wild places to photograph. And this has given rise to quite a few other books and projects in many different places, such as uh, South America in particular, because I have uh, spent a lot of time traveling around South America because it was the closest to home, but then even beyond that, Ultimately, I feel very lucky that my career has taken me essentially from the wide ocean and even from below the ocean with the great blue whales, the largest animals ever existing on the planet, up to some of the highest mountains in South America, in the Himalayas, and so on. And from deserts, uh, here is the Atacama Desert on the coast of Peru, to the jungles, of many parts of the world, the Amazon jungle and the cloud forest. Likewise, from the Arctic down to the Antarctic, 
and many, many places in between. And so it is my great fortune to have been able to photograph the most amazing wild animals in all seven continents of the world. Africa, Asia, even Europe, but perhaps less so. North America, South America, as I mentioned before, Australia, and the great white continent of Antarctica, and many, many islands around the world as well, some very wild places like this one. This is north of Norway in the Barents Sea, Bear Island. So these are, this is the food for my adventures and for my work. And I must say, the wilder it is, the happier I feel. It doesn't really matter whether it's cold or whether it's hot or whether it's wet or whether it's a mixture of the three. <laughs> I enjoy very much being on my own. Here I was camping in the New Zealand subantarctic islands. Up on the tops of the islands in the winter, it was really a fantastically wild place to be. And also spending time on the ocean, sailing and exploring. That's a great way to explore. And uh, as long as you're prepared for the right, with the right gear, for the right weather, it's always a great pleasure to be in these extraordinarily wild places sailing or diving or hiking. And I really don't mind if the living can be a little bit rough sometimes, and the food may be not such um, gourmet. <laughs> as long as there are some animals to photograph, that's where I'm happy. And uh, this is, again, this is my last trip to the Galapagos Islands last, uh, last July when I was photographing these wonderful turtles. And that was really how I was launched into the, into the world, the wonderful world of nature photography and writing. And I have now had publications, magazines and books in I think over 40 countries and different languages. When I was in um, Indonesia about uh, 15 years ago, I learned from a scientist how to explore and climb up into the treetops, into the canopy to do some photography up there that was rather intimidating at first, I have to admit, because when you look down a tree, it looks very different than when you're looking up somehow, especially when the wind is blowing and it's bending and twisting. But on that occasion, I was able to photograph this remarkable bird, a hornbill in Sulawesi for the first time in the wild. Other photographers has, have done uh, work of this type since then, but on that opportunity, I was actually the first, and so that provided a huge boost to my career because everybody was interested in that coverage. It's very difficult nowadays for a photographer to find something that nobody, no one has photographed before, but it's always extremely exciting when you do achieve such an opportunity. I took that skill later to the forest of uh, the Amazon in Peru, and... Uh, now I had the technique a little bit more practical, um, practically advanced. And I can assure you that when you're in a tree 46 meters above the ground, you drop so many things. You never realize when you're standing on the sur surface of the earth how often you drop things, whether it's your, you know, your, your pen or your, in this case your film or your anything. So everything had to be tied on, not just myself. And of course, the rewards of being in the different world, up in the treetops, in the forest, seeing the birds where they live. As I said all along, my pursuit is to try to be in their world, to share a little bit of the magic of that wildness. One book that I did that took me 25 years to produce was a book about the Andes of South America. And I wanted to show the wild side of the Andes, and for that I needed to go where the condor flies because the condor flies where everything is wild. So the book does the entire length of the, the Andean mountain chain, and it took me 25 years to put this book together. 
from fire to ice, essentially, and uh, from the equator all the way to the tip of Cape Horn, through some of the incredible forests and the uh, unbelievable biodiversity of the uh, tropical cloud forest in the high Andes, the cock of the rock, the toucans, etc., the volcanoes throughout the Andes of Ecuador and Peru, and of course down into the higher latitudes in Argentina and Chile, Patagonia, and as I said, all the way to Cape Horn. Twenty years ago, I came to New Zealand to visit a friend and fell in love because of the low number of people living there. Nowadays, there's four and a half thousand, uh, four and a half million people living in New Zealand, and it's bigger than England, to give you an idea. So the wildness is very present, including active volcano, huge national parks, incredible forests, mountains, and some incredible wildlife as well. So that's really the essence of a very tantalizing place for me. And as a result, 20 years ago, I actually moved and settled in New Zealand. And I've done a book that follows the New Zealand environment, sort of going from different habitats where different types of animals and birds live. The last picture was the kia, the mountain parrot in the snowy regions of the high mountains. In the green forests, you get the kiwi, the national bird of New Zealand, a remarkable bird that uh, is not easy at all to photograph. It's really quite uh, a challenge to photograph these birds. They are mostly active at night and uh, quite shy and fairly rare. But other aspects are quite spectacular, especially in the springtime when the wild trees come into bloom. The yellow flower is the kofi, the national flower of New Zealand, and the bird on it is a nectar-eating bird called tui, the same name as I have. And all my life people asked me, where did you get your name? How come you have such a name? And I had to explain that my parents read about somebody named Tui in the South Pacific and they liked the name and just gave it to me. When I went to New Zealand, I thought, wonderful, they will stop asking me, where did I get my name? Well, now they say, how come you have a New Zealand name when you weren't born here? <laughs> my latest project was the dream of every photographer that was to go to East Africa, to Kenya, and I was asked to do a book about the highlands of Kenya, which was um, literally the book just rolled off the press uh, about a month ago. It was a dream come true, but I also was aware that very, very many different photographers have been working in this part of the world, and I really wanted to try to make it a little bit different with my colleagues. Um, the three of us, we tried to, to get a different impression, a different view of a, f a subject that is familiar in many books of photography. So we really wanted to try to show the wider environment, the animals in their environment, not just the close-ups. We spent a lot of time doing what every photographer does in uh, that part of the, the world, going on safari, photographing from vehicles, but we soon found out that vehicles have their limitations. And uh, by, uh, by the second or third month I was there, I was able to go out completely on my own, which I far more enjoy than having a driver and a guide. But I also learned to uh, change tires fairly efficiently, going cross-country under the rather intrigued look of the giraffes. So the book came out. It's about the highlands of Kenya. It's the plateau of Laikipia that is found between on the foot of Mount Kenya itself. So it's not the lowlands. It's the it's about 1,800 meters elevation, and it's a really a wonderful environment. A big, wide open, rolling landscape with a lot of varied um, habitat, varied climate arid climate, but I also happened to arrive just as some very heavy rains began. And for me, it was the challenge that for the first time to actually include people in my book. And um, there are many different tribes in the area, but the most, um, the most closely connected with the land are the Samburu and the Pokot, who have maintained their traditions very strongly in their, their form of dress. 
And uh, that was quite a, an interesting new experience for me to photograph the human side as well as the wildlife. Needless to say, there were all the classic, the, the, the classic animals that everyone wants to photograph if you're a wildlife photographer and very rewarding. But again, I wanted to show something a little different, uh, the impression, the, again, that low angle to give you a feeling of just how big these animals are, not the, the usual telephoto view, but perhaps a wide angle view where possible um, to, to get the mood of the environment. And that took a lot of time. It was uh, a much longer project than perhaps would be to just go on your normal safari and get uh, big close-ups of the animals. But I felt very happy with the, the results, having, again, the, the predator hiding, stalking, the little playful baby hippo playing with the big bull, the lions scanning the landscape for the, the evening meal as the sun goes down. But my biggest project of all was actually very, very different. And that was a dream that turned into an obsession and a passion and eventually into a book. And that was to photograph all of the different species of albatrosses in the world. There are 22 different species and all of them live in very, very remote places. They are found, they nest on islands that are very rarely visited, most of them in the southern ocean, in the stormiest part of the world, where very few people go, and if they do, it's uh, sometimes cruise ships go here and they spend a few hours near these islands. And I really, really wanted to be part of that world, to experience it, to see it, to feel it. I really wanted to follow the albatrosses across the waves, not just on the sunny days, but on the stormy days as well. And so my partner then and myself, we decided to save up and actually buy a 13-meter um, sailboat and to prepare it to sail to the Southern Ocean, to the, what is called the latitudes of the, the roaring 40s and the furious 50s. That's the name that the sailors gave to these latitudes for good reason. And it was a fantastic adventure. I can assure you that a lot of the time I wasn't thinking about photographs. And in fact, the most exciting moments, for some strange reason, I don't have any pictures of. But um, we arrived in some of these incredible places and put our little tiny boat in these magnificent landscapes and indeed found the subject of our quest. This is in the New Zealand subantarctic islands. There are five groups of islands south of New Zealand. And between all these islands, there's about half of the world's albatrosses come to these islands to nest. You probably know that the albatross is the largest flying seabird in the world. It has a wingspan that can reach three and a half meters in length. Now you can imagine that's almost from here to the books over there. Maybe a little bit less, but almost. That's an enormous bird. Uh, here's a, another picture that shows my hand. This is my handprint in the mud next to the footprint of an albatross. And of course here I was able to practice my favorite sport and that's to get down low amongst them. And that shows you the result of that picture. Or to hang over the cliff edge and get the view of where some of the different kinds nest. Some of the more intimate moments of their courtship, of their breeding, of their babies in the nest this was a very, very rewarding experience. Five years, um, we sailed. We had a very special permit. These islands are very closely protected. And during five years, we went back to these islands time and again. We'd made seven trips and a total of nine months of sailing to the five different groups of islands. This was the most remarkable place because it's an island called the Bounty Islands. It's a bunch, a group of little rocks. Uh, southeast of New Zealand, and the last time anyone had been to these islands was seven years before. And we were only the third group who landed on the island and, and lived there for 10 days since the 1880s when the seal hunters were hunting the seals on these islands. We went there because there's a species of albatross that's found only on that island, the Salvin's albatross, but I can assure you it was a pretty exciting little adventure. We arrived on a very calm day, as this picture shows, and the next morning the same view looked like this. So the boat had to hide on the other side of the island, and um, we took turns 
staying on, on the camp or staying on shore. And at the end of 10 years, well, the book finally came to be. And it's really my biggest pride and joy is this book about all the 22 species of albatrosses. Now I'm working on a similar, on a sister book that is about the penguins of the world. And here this will certainly bring some new characters into focus, some quite exciting ones and some quite eloquent ones. 18 species of penguins, so not quite as many as the albatrosses. And certainly a few more adventures coming up and some more moments to share in the future. And after that, I'm not so sure. I'm hoping maybe I will be able to continue working in the Andes. I particularly love the tropical Andes, the cloud forest environment, and I hope that will be my next book. So at this point, that is only a dream, but maybe it will too become a book. So with that, I'd like to thank you, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much, Tui. I think we still have five minutes for a, a question and answer. I myself uh, realized three things now um, with, uh, by, by seeing the show. The first thing is that you're using the photography as an excuse to get out to these absolutely wonderful places. Absolutely, I admit it. <laughs> and the second one, um, I see like a... a also, by the photography, I see a deep connection with a, like the goal um, to to reach out to people to work for conservation. I think that's an absolutely admirable thing um, that you do and that you've been doing all your life, as we could see. And that's something I think that's very special. And and uh, I'd like a big round of applause for for that effort as well. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. And of course, of seeing these wonderful pictures, I'm really looking forward to the two presentations that you're going to be giving at the at Lake Constance in, in three weeks. That's going to be absolutely fine. So now, if there's a few questions in the in the audience, we I think Tui would be happy to answer because right after the after the presentation, she will be out um, signing books. So it, I think that's a good chance now to have uh, to have questions answered. We have to give you a microphone, I'm afraid. <laughs> I would like to know something about the uh, change you realized in Galapagos uh, about the uh, last 30, 40 years. Yes, it's a, it's a complicated question, but it's actually the answer is fairly simple, however, because, of course, uh, islands like the Galapagos became what they are, became unique because of their isolation, because the species that lived there had no contact with the mainland and therefore became different. When people arrived, which happened already two centuries ago, they brought other animals, mammals, predators and so on, and they started to deeply affect the ecosystem. Then arrived the colonists and the tourists, and that created more contact with the outside world. Tourism is a double-edged sword, if you like, because on one hand, it is the best reason to preserve islands like Galapagos that belong to a third world country. It's the best reason that you can ever invent because any other form of financial use of the islands will be much more damaging than tourism. Tourism in Galapagos is very well managed. We now get over 100,000 people a year, but even so, you don't see the effect of tourism on the islands. Many of the problems of the past have been corrected, like the tortoises that were almost extinct and that have been increased. Animal predators and goats and mammals that were on the islands have been taken off, have been exterminated. So many islands are actually in better condition now than they have been for 200 years. However, the contact with the outside world is like a ticking bomb because we have already had problems, new ants, new 
um, mosquitoes, new plants, all sorts of organisms, not necessarily the big ones like the goats and the rats and the pigs, but the little tiny ones that will affect and are affecting the ecosystem. And with the more contact, every time a new airplane comes, a new ship, there is more danger. And so it's, we are winning and we are losing all at the same time. The beauty of it is that if you go to Galapagos, you don't actually see any change. In fact, the changes generally are positive. But I think a disaster could still happen any time. So I'm sorry it's a long answer, but it is a complex question. Well, I think there's one last question, and then I think our time is already up. Um, I'd like to say already thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for, for so much for coming here. Um, I think it was a wonderful. Question. I just wanted to know where you live in New Zealand. I live in a place called Golden Bay. It's at the top end of the South Island. If you've been there, it's about an hour and a half driving west of Nelson. So it's a beautiful bay, very green. It gets quite a bit of rain, but it also is one of the sunniest places in New Zealand. So I feel very lucky in Golden Bay, I'm afraid. So thank you very much, everybody. If it's too long way to go all the way to the north end of the South Island, you can have a chance to see and talk to each other a few minutes um, right uh, afterwards or in three minutes when you're out there. Um, thank you so much again, Tui, that you've been here and that you are here. And thanks so much for your efforts and for your wonderful photography. And thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you. Lady.